One of the great enigmas in our solar system is the creation of the asteroid belt. There are two primary theories to explain it. The first is accepted by nearly all mainstream astronomers, and that is the solar nebula hypothesis. This hypothesis states that in the primordial solar nebula, when the gases and dust were collapsing to form the sun and the planets, some junk was left over, and that junk created the asteroid belt as well as the comets. The alternate hypothesis is that a planet did form between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, and it exploded for reasons currently unknown. The first person to connect the asteroid belts and the possibility of an exploding planet was Olbers in 1802, and it was Lagrange in 1814 who noted that the highly elliptical orbits of the comets could also be explained by an exploding planet. This outraged the supporters of the Laplacian solar nebula hypothesis as the origin of the comets, and they attacked. Unfortunately, Lagrange died later that year, and he essentially took the exploding planet hypothesis with him until it was resurrected more recently by the now late astronomer Thomas Van Flandern. Thomas Van Flandern amassed a great deal of physical evidence, data, that supported the exploding planet hypothesis. This study, which I am presenting to you today, is a remote viewing study in which we were able to send four of the very best military-grade remote viewers back in time to witness the origin of the asteroid belt. To do this, we looked at two asteroids. The first is 433 Eros. This is a silicate or S-type asteroid, and the S-type asteroids lie within a band that is a little bit closer to Mars than Jupiter within the asteroid belt. These are very highly reflective, very bright asteroids. The second asteroid is 253 Mathilda. That's a carbonaceous or C-type asteroid. It's very dark, and the C-type asteroids reside within a band that's a little bit farther out in the asteroid belt. Thomas Van Flandern had hypothesized that there might have been two planetary bodies, possibly a gas giant and then a smaller Earth-sized planet that exploded at some point in the past, creating the different bands within the asteroid belt. So we looked at two asteroids from the asteroid belt that are very different in nature to see if there was an explosion or a solar nebulous collapsing concept uh, with respect to their origin. We also looked at the dark splotch, which is on the side of Iapetus. This dark splotch, Thomas Van Flandern hypothesized, was caused by a debris wave that resulted from the exploding planet, and the debris wave traveled rapidly throughout the entire solar system, and when it encountered Iapetus, it left that dark splotch on it. Iapetus is a white, airless, icy moon of Saturn, and it is tidally locked so it does not rotate on its axis. So essentially it would have held steady while the debris wave rapidly hit it. Mainstream astronomers wanting to avoid the concept of a exploding planet have come up with other reasons for that dark splotch. Originally they were saying it was dark material that was sublimating up from the interior of Iapetus. That was a hard sell to be honest, given the way it looks. More recently, Scientists are saying that there is another moon of Saturn that is dipping in and out of a newly discovered ring structure and tossing material gradually over millions of years onto that exact spot on Iapetus, causing that dark splotch. Now we are able to send remote viewers back in time to see if the dark splotch was caused by a sudden impact of a rapidly moving debris wave or if it was caused by a gradual deposition of material over millions of years. The remote viewing, the science of remote viewing, as it is used in this study, is explained in my book, Remote Viewing, the Science and Theory of Non-Physical Perception. It is the only book of its kind that explains the science of remote viewing as remote viewing is done using structured data collection procedures that were developed by the U.S. military for espionage purposes or procedures that are derivative of those procedures. In this case, we are using two methodologies, CRV, controlled remote viewing, with a group of remote viewers led by Lynn Buchanan out of Army Intelligence and 
Hawaii Remote Viewers Guild, or HRVG procedures, with a group led by Glenn Wheaton out of Special Forces Intelligence. Two remote viewing methodologies, four remote viewers, 12 remote viewing sessions, and these remote viewers are the absolute top scoring in a year-long multiple universe project that was conducted at the Farsight Institute. The remote viewers are Daz Smith using CRV, Deborah duggan Takaji, Dick Algeyer, and Maria using HRVG methods. And this table summarizes the results of the study numerically in terms of clarity scores, here interpreted as a zero means there's absolutely no support in that remote viewing session for that particular hypothesis. A three indicates that there is perfect dead-on support within that remote viewing session for that particular hypothesis. Twos and ones are gradations in between. We have three targets, the origin of Eros, the origin of Mathilda, and the origin of that dark splotch on the side of Iapetus. As you can see from this table, there is almost no support within these remote viewing data for the solar nebula or gradualism hypothesis for the origin of Eros, Mathilda, or the dark splotch on the side of Iapetus. And there is tremendous support for the exploding planet or catastrophism hypothesis with respect to these data. Let's look at some of these data. Now the graphics I'm about to show you are taken from longer sessions. These graphics are very compatible with the rest of the sessions, and all of the sessions are available for free to see, to download, to examine at the Institute's website, www.farsight.org. Here we have Dick Algeyer using HRVG methods, and he clearly saw an exploding planet. Here he draws the planet cracking up and energy exploding outward. Deborah Duggan Takaji with HRVG methods. She found a planetary system within the Milky Way. And then she also found an extremely bright light that is like a supernova within that planetary system. And something also like a black hole, something sucking in and then rapidly exploding outward. And then she writes, there is expanding energy at the target from a tiny particle growing to a huge mass. The movement is a massive vortex with a rippling wave effect and vibrational energy. There is indescribably bright light that is sun-like at the target. There is a Milky Way-like star system and a black hole that sucks energy at the target. Daz Smith, CRV. He clearly finds an exploding planet with a debris wave and he writes the feel of an explosion and then forced movement outwards in all directions and he draws it. Now let's move to Mathilda, Dick Algeyer, HRVG methods. At the top, you see him showing the explosion with the energy coming out. And then he writes that this is some kind of atomic level reaction, energy to mass. And then he writes it results in something hard, solid-like, like a diamond. And then he draws it. Carefully look at that bottom sketch of what he says it looks like, that it results in. Because that was the target, Mathilda. This is what you get with military-grade remote viewing. You cannot get this with untrained people. These remote viewers have an average training period, intensive training period, of a decade or more in these military or military-derived procedures to be able to do this kind of thing. Remote viewing is not easily or casually done. If you go, for example, to hear Lang Lang play the piano, well, you go to hear Lang Lang play the piano because he plays the piano like hardly anyone else plays the piano. Well, when you go to look at the remote viewing data that are produced by people like this, you do that because they can do stuff that most people cannot do because of the training that's been involved. Now here for the Mathilda session, Daz Smith, CRV, he clearly finds the exploding planet and the debris wave again, and he draws it and writes, exploding movement, expanding movement in all directions, a lot of energy, explosive. And then he writes, like the Big Bang. Now let's move to the dark splotch on the side of Iapetus. Here, Dick Algeyer, he draws something collapsing in and then exploding outward, and then he writes, compresses in suddenly to become very dense, almost solid, and then immediately reverses and expands outward, losing its density. 
Again, Iapetus, Daz Smith, he actually finds the debris wave, and within the debris wave he finds large, rapidly moving rocks, asteroids. This is what we were looking for that connects the debris wave with the origin of the asteroid belt to see if it was the same phenomenon that created both. This point was explicitly made by Deborah Duggan Takaji. Now this sketch is very interesting, this picture, this image. At the end of her remote viewing session, she continued her session by going to her computer and using Photoshop to create an image that exactly represented what she perceived during her session. And this is that image. So you can clearly see that she found an asteroid within the debris wave, making that connection between the debris wave that hit Iapetus, creating that dark splotch, and the event that created the asteroids. When mainstream astronomers look at planetary development, they do so from the perspective of uniformitarianism or gradualism. And that is that there are general processes that occur all over the universe and that these processes work very slowly. However, catastrophism is different. Catastrophism says that all processes begin with a singularity or a bifurcation point. And this bifurcation point essentially destroys what was ever there before, and a new process begins. And this process begins with an exponential growth phase with positive feedback, and then a little slower growth with negative feedback, and then that ends with some type of ending condition. And that ending condition is often a constant steady state or a periodic limit cycle or perhaps a chaotic attractor. But that ending state ends as well one day. And when that ending state ends, it's because of the arrival of a new bifurcation point. And then a new process starts over with the same type of growth processes. That is the major difference between catastrophism and uniformitarianism. Between the bookends of the origin and the ending points for catastrophism, catastrophism and gradualism or uniformitarianism are actually very similar. But it's those bookends, it's those ending points, the origin and the ending points that really distinguishes catastrophism from uniformitarianism. If you look at the Carina Nebula, it's so tempting for mainstream astronomers to look at that and say, this is a good example of uniformitarianism or gradualism. As the clouds and the dust are collapsing to form, the sun, the planets, stars are forming, this is clearly a slow, gradual process. However, look at Mars. Mars is heavily cratered on one side. In fact, that cratered half of Mars is also much thicker. The crust is much thicker than the other side. Now, if you spin Mars around to the other side, you find that it has almost no craters on it. A couple volcanoes, a couple craters, but essentially it is flat. Now, if you look at the dividing line between the cratered side and the flat or uncratered side, it clearly looks as if something happened to Mars on one side that did not happen to Mars on the other side. And that's exactly what Thomas Van Flandern said. He said that a planet that was near Mars exploded, creating all those craters on the side of Mars. And this, he says, is exactly what happened with Iapetus. The major difference between Iapetus and Mars is that Mars was much closer to the exploding planet than Iapetus. Iapetus was much farther away. These data which I have presented to you today strongly support the exploding planet hypothesis as the origin of the asteroid belt, corroborating a great deal of physical evidence that was outlined by the now late astronomer Thomas Van Flandern. These data also support the idea that planetary development, at least in our neck of the woods, follows paths that more closely correspond with the principles of catastrophism as compared with uniformitarianism or gradualism. We call on leaders within the mainstream scientific community to publicly acknowledge the reality of the remote viewing phenomenon while there is still time for this to significantly benefit humanity. This will allow us to demonstrate remote viewing to a truly world audience, not to tens of thousands of people as we have done so in the past, but to millions and perhaps billions until this is done. 
humanity will continue to march blindly into the future. Unprepared psychologically, it will crash into near-term challenges with brutal force. Let me be clear. Our planet is not going to explode. Not now, not ever. But as I have presented in our 2012 climate project study that was done at the Farsight Institute, the post-2012 period appears to be a period in which a new bifurcation point is rapidly approaching, perhaps in less than two years, in terms of humanity's development on this planet. Our data appear to correspond closely with predictive assertions being issued regularly by NASA and NOAA regarding post-2012 solar disturbances, telecommunications, and the power grid. Despite the regular predictive hints, however dire, only the well-connected wealthy are listening while the rest of humanity is being left behind. If you are currently unaware of these predictive hints, then that may prove my point. At this crucial moment, nothing would assist humanity more profoundly and more quickly than the psychological maturation that would result from the widespread recognition of the remote viewing phenomenon. The trigger to set this all in motion must come from leaders within the mainstream scientific community. And to those leaders, I say to you today, if you do your part, we will do ours. The time to initiate that catalytic sequence of profound learning events is now.